Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Hey. I feel really, um, really happy and grateful that I've been able to be part of some great conversations this week on diversity and inclusion. And I feel like, ah, oh, there's a whole community of us. These are my people. <laughs> and so I'm really happy to be able to share in a more formal way um, kind of what's in my head on the topic of speaker diversity, and in particular the story that we have of how in one year we went from 14% to 50% women speakers at our own local WordCamp, and how we got three times as many um, women speakers to apply. So first, before I start, I just kind of want to get a sense of the folks in the room. So by show of hands, how many have done public speaking about anything Drupal related? Okay, a few of us, great. How many haven't yet but have thought about it? Nice. How many here are organizers of Drupal events or on Drupal committees? Wonderful. How many wish more women and people who identify as women and other underrepresented groups applied to speak at their events? <laughs> Not just hands, but like enthusiastic hands. <laughs> Lovely. And lastly, how many have no idea what they're doing in this room? All right, everybody is intentionally here or too shy to admit it. <laughs> nice. Either way, you are all welcome. So I want to tell you a story, a story time. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, in 2013 in Vancouver, British Columbia, it was my first time being one of the co-organizers of WordCamp Vancouver. And so WordCamp is the same thing as your Drupal camps. It's a locally organized uh, conference about our technology. And uh, there were three of us. It was our first time for all three of us to be co-organizing. And we were sitting there in one of our apartments with 40 speaker applications spread out before us. We actually had 52 applications, and 50 of them were applicable. And so here we are with this daunting task, choose talks. We had 14 spots available. We had two tracks, um, and seven women applied out of the 52. Six of them were a fit, and one of the co-organizers said, well, we're gonna take all these. And I'm the one who didn't know that this is an issue. I'm the one who said, shouldn't we be like checking that the pitches are great? And by the way, all the pitches <laughs> were great, so that was already a non-issue. Um, shouldn't, shouldn't we be checking you know, how they fit in with the rest of the conference and their talks and, and their speaker experience and all these things? And he said, well, their talks are great. They do fit in with our conference and frankly, if we don't take as many as we can, we are going to get called out for it. This was back in 2013 when there was less conversation happening about it, and so um, this is the kind of viewpoint that we had. And so then two things happened. One is we added a third track, and this increased our number of speaker spots to 28. And the reason we did this is we just had so many amazing presentations presented to us, and and we were a bit greedy. We're like, we just want them all. Let's. And we were first time organizers. That was a lesson learned. <laughs> when one is doing the, uh, their very first conference, don't have three tracks. Word to the wise, uh, the, my WordPress community organizer folk here are agreeing with this. <laughs> the other thing that happened, oh, oh so, so then it became six out of 28 instead of six out of 14. And the other thing that happened is two women dropped out for family obligations. So then, suddenly it was four out of 28. Before I go on, side note, who can guess how many men dropped out for family obligations? <laughs> All right, so uh, for the video, I'll tell you, people have raised a zero sign Let's see if you're right. <laughs> Zero men dropped out for family obligations. Not that, that it never happens, but that was our case in that particular one. So then this, is, this was our ugly, ugly percentage, 14% women speakers. 
This cat is not happy about that. <laughs> I'll keep talking while you take a picture. Um, so, as you can imagine, we did get called out for it. We even had blog posts written about it. As we should. And so this is kind of what started the seed on my journey. And the next thing that added to the seed is finding out it wasn't just us. In that same year, I went to WordCamp San Francisco, which was basically, at the time, our version of DrupalCon. They, they've now grown it to something else, WordCamp US, but this was... Um, the, the WordPress folk are reminiscing of the old days that before, before our word, giant WordCamps had become what they are. But this was basically, you know, at headquarters, the big, well, I called it the WordCamp of all WordCamps at the time. And uh, there was a WordCamp organizers brunch that I went to. And of course, I brought up this topic and I asked people what their experiences were. And they were amazed. They said, you had seven speak women uh, and people who identify as women apply to speak. We had none at all. Tell us your magic that you got some. Um, and they all said, we want more diverse speakers. We want more women and people who identify as women. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that definition in a moment. But um, we wanted to accept more, but they're just not applying. So if they're not applying, then we can't bring them in. Before I continue in my story, I do have a little disclaimer. And my disclaimer is, I'm going to talk for the rest of my talk about gender like it is a binary and like there are two blobs, like, like all women are exactly the same on the spectrum over here and all men are the same um, on the, at the spectrum over here. But I do want to address that that is not the case. There is a wide spectrum in between and even the typical women and men experiences, uh, you know, often they actually... Um, have the same experiences and they overlap. Um, and I also want to address that I kind of use women as a shortcut and I know I shouldn't, but in the meantime, until I figure out a better way to say it, I do mean, um, and this was something that um, Sage um, helped me with earlier this week, um, the terminology, uh, possible terminology to use, cis and trans women, trans men, genderqueer folk. Um, Frankly, I mean not having only young white men be the speakers. I'll just say it. Um, so I want to address that. I'll be saying women and men and addressing the blobs. Um, I also want to mention that the last time I gave this talk, one of the men came up to me afterwards and thanked me for this slide in particular. And he said, um, you know, a lot of the issues that uh, the women were facing, he was facing himself because he was a child minder um, of his family and things like that. So he, so he said, you know, he would have been very put off had I not had the slide and he thanked me for it. Okay, so moving on. Why does it matter and who cares who, the, who this person is at the front of the room? Shouldn't it just be the best speaker, which kind of the best speaker kind of means the person with the most speaking experience because there are a lot of really great speakers who haven't had much experience yet and we just need to help them do that. So... Um, why does it matter? Well, um, I'm not sure the situation in Drupal, but speaking for WordPress, our audiences um, typically are about 50-50 men and women. So if the person at the front of the room isn't representing them, then they kind of feel like they don't belong there. There's also um, our users and our developers, the people working with the tools and who are using the tools. We also in WordPress ha are really lucky that um, it's uh, because there's kind of a low barrier of entry to start using it as opposed to things like Drupal that are a little bit more challenging to start with. Um, we have a really, really wide um, uh, kind of people who, are, um, who start it. Because they don't necessarily have to have um, degrees to start. And I'm going to stop before I say something stupid. Um, but I think you get the, the point that... Um, we have a very diverse set of people who are using it, and if the people at the front of the stage are not representative, rep representative of them, then that is off-putting as well. And also, our speakers help shape our technology. And specifically, um, when people are speaking about the technology and people are getting ideas from that, we want to have diverse ideas, both in making sure that um, different kinds of people's needs are met, 
let's say it was only young white men um, who were shaping the technology, well, they wouldn't be necessarily accounting for older folk who uh, can't read small print and need to see contrast in the screen. Um, they might not be thinking about um, the, the mother or father who is um, multitasking, feeding a baby, and taking care of a toddler and trying to use a website at the same time, and all kinds of issues that we might not even think of if it, it weren't for um, people speaking about them, as well as different kinds of people have different kinds of ideas. And so if we bring in more voices and more perspectives, it benefits everybody. And they also um, sometimes not only have unique perspectives, perspectives, but might be doing multi-roles. There could be power users who use it in interesting ways, front-end developers, business people who are using uh, plugins or modules to make specific kinds of sites, typographers who use um, WordPress or Drupal to, to do crazy things with typography, um, how developers can communicate with designers, different things that you can do with the websites, etc. All right. So here's the big question. What was stopping them from applying? First thing I want to say is society is a funny thing. And there's a lot of things in society that I see as the obstacles in the way. And as much as I would love to change all of society, I am only one person. So I want to address that there are more reasons than I can address today. but. I figured out one tiny thing that we could do something about, and that has what my laser focus has become. That was when we would ask women, hey, would you like to speak at my conference? We would get almost always one of two answers. Any ideas, what do you think those could be? I don't have anything to say. I don't have anything to say. I wouldn't be any good. I wouldn't be any good. Hand at the back. I'm not an expert. You guys are really already well-educated on this topic. <laughs> I don't even need to be talking about this. This is great. Um, so the two answers, the way I phrase them is, what would I talk about? And I don't know enough about whatever topic to give a talk about it. Same thing as I'm not an expert. And so that became my starting place. And so one day, I was given an idea this happened. <laughs> um, of all places, this happened at a feminist blanket fort slumber party. <laughs> As one would imagine, what we do at feminist blanket fort slumber parties is we talk about feminist issues. And so at some point, I brought up the topic of this issue that we're facing with our WordCamp and said, hey, they're not even applying in the first place. These are the two answers that we're getting. And one of them looked at me and said, why don't you just get them in a room and get them to brainstorm ideas? That was the thing that started me on my several year path since then. It was get them to brainstorm, show them that they literally have 100 ideas, which is how many we generate in one of the exercises, and then the biggest problem becomes picking one, which is very empowering for people to walk in thinking they have nothing to talk about, and then in the first quarter go, they're all good topics, I don't know what to do. This is, it's, it's, a, it's wonderful, and I also suggest to them, pick something for the rest of the day, you don't have to stick with it. Uh, the next thing that happened is um, somebody let WordCamp Central know that I was doing this workshop because they knew that this was something that they're interested in. And, and so then they and I started chatting. And they, they started helping me shape what was going to be in this workshop. And one of the items in particular was uh, talk formats. They told me about how at the time, a lot of tech talks were kind of a, a brain dump how-to session. This is how to build a module. Da, 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 da. Here are the steps. And people would walk away not, necess not necessarily remembering what they had learned. And so they wanted to promote more story-based talks because then people um, might not remember the details, but they kind of learn how to learn, be inspired to try things, etc. And so we talked about the different talk formats. Um, so there's how to, the standard way that tech talks happen, leading a discussion. You're the facilitator on a topic and the audience discusses it together. 
running a panel where multiple people answer questions on the same topic, story-based, like I'm doing right now, um, and this could be how you learned something, mistakes you made, or any other narrative format. Case study, the story of how you created one thing in particular, and also workshop, a hands-on learning experience where people bring their laptops and create a thing as you go. And I just want to mention that there was a few years where I didn't really feel like I was able to do public speaking for a bit when I had um, some health stuff going on, but I did feel like I could stand in front of a room or sit with people and do workshops and, and kind of feel like I'm just chatting with friends one-on-one. -on -one. I'm leading them through something. And for me, that was a lot easier than standing up in front of a room. I also would like to talk about myths. Um, so the, the brainstorm idea was to tackle one of those questions, which is I wouldn't know what to talk about. And I also just want to cover a little bit of um, how, it, how we would help them through the question of, I don't know enough to talk about anything. And so we cover the myths of who is the person standing in front of the room. Are they an expert? So myth one, I am not an expert. Um, it's, so the person in the front of the room may not be the expert. It may just be the person who said yes to speaking, especially at the meetup level. There's a little thing that the educated people in this room, which is everybody here, may have heard of before, called imposter syndrome, which is um, that the person in front of the room uh, da, 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 is um, thinking that you don't really have the knowledge or skills to be here, but you've somehow managed to fool everyone, and soon they are going to find out. Now, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, women and other underrepresented groups tend to feel this a little bit more. Not, not saying that um, the, the standard speakers don't also feel it, but um, the, the men and other represent groups kind of feel like if they only know a little bit about a topic, they don't know enough to speak on it, whereas typically the typical blob man um, feels like if they know a little bit, then they can get up and talk about it. And also, I would like to argue that you're always an expert because you are an expert in your own experiences. Myths two through five. People will ask questions I can't answer and I'll look like a fool. Um, we have, in this workshop that we've created, we have given template answers for like the smarty pants in the audience, people asking questions that are too hard, um, people asking questions that are completely off topic, et cetera. I'm too nervous to speak. I can pretty much guarantee that just about every public speaker is probably extremely nervous about being up there. Uh, I have panic right now, but I haven't died. And I probably, like, you have no idea how much I'm panicking inside, but that's, that's part of public speaking. And it's also okay, you know? It's okay if you actually are visibly showing it. It's, it's okay to tell the audience what you're going through, and then you kind of get them on board with you, and, and often they become your supporters as well. I have failed if everyone in the audience isn't totally engaged. Uh, so there's a thing called resting face, where people are just kind of absorbing the information. Also, they might be tweeting about how amazing you are. I forgot to mention at the start, my Twitter is Jill Binder. So if you want to talk about amazing things about this talk on Twitter, that's where to do it. That's, where, that's how to tag me. Um, and also, people can be taking notes or, or you know, thinking about what you've said. And lastly, a talk followed by a Q&A is the only format that I can use to share my knowledge. So we talked about different talk formats, and so it doesn't have to be that format. Besides this workshop that we created, which I'm going to circle back to, what are other things did we do to get more women? And this is one of the things that I've talked a lot about in discussions earlier this week, so this might be review for some of you, but this is kind of a, um, between, this is kind of a lot of the things that I know about it. So basically, Oh, first of all, in the year following 2013, we not only wanted to get 50% women speakers, we wanted to do it at a developer edition. And even in WordPress, there are fewer women developers than there are men, even now. That's, still, that's something that other groups are working on, like ladies learning code, other... That's a big thing in Canada. I'm not sure what groups you have here, but um, I'm like, people are tackling that problem. I can tackle a problem that people aren't tackling so much. 
Um, so I spent the year networking with more women in WordPress. Whenever I'd go places, I would try to meet them and get their contact. So I met people um, online, in forums, in person. There's women of WordPress groups that have started since that year, and so those are people I'm networking with now as well. Um, also, our team sent out personal invitations to apply to WordPress women of our Tri-City region, and our region is Vancouver, BC, Seattle, and Portland. And personal invitations is one of the most powerful things, by the way, for getting people to, to do things they wouldn't normally do, like public speaking. Other things that we did, um, we encouraged them to speak at small meetups first before getting up on a big WordCamp stage. So for our WordPress meetup, and our WordPress meetup is really well attended. We typically get max capacity, which in our room is 50. Um, and so if people didn't feel comfortable with that, we encourage them to speak at other meetups that are smaller, in front of family and friends. And also um, in BC, it's pretty easy to move around and get to other uh, meetups as well, so encouraging them to go to some of the small towns around and speak there. We also made sure that we had good language, languaging in our meetup word camp and word shop, workshop descriptions. So we don't use words that encourage people to self-identify as an expert because of that imposter syndrome thing. So we don't use words like sup superhero, ninja, rock star. And for our workshop in particular, we made sure to word it to bring out the people who have imposter syndrome. We also, our meetups were um, happening in a venue with three flights of stairs. And so I wanted to make sure that our workshop was not at this venue. I made sure it was at a spot that had elevators and ramps. And I mentioned it to our meetup, um, and they immediately changed to that venue for our meetups, which I'm very proud of. Uh, and we also um, requested that it be a scent-free zone because there are quite a few people who are allergic. So these accessibility issues, um, it's good in general, as well as we wanted to make sure that we brought out all women, not just a select subsection of women and people who identify as women and trans and et cetera. And then there's also a couple things I wanted to mention that we added to the workshop itself. Um, we let them know that they can get up and move around because some people have some physical issues where they get antsy in their bodies. And the way we were running our workshop was four hours, so we wanted to make sure people could get up. Um, we, we don't promote that for everybody. There's versions that you can do one, one and a half hours as well. Um, we'd also ask, ask for the preferred pronoun, both in the introductions as well as the third time that we ran this workshop this, this year, we also um, did kind of a quick and dirty different color name tags. Um, and so you can see my, my quick, this is how we're doing it. Uh, green is she, her, red, he, him, they, them, uh, mix, etc. for other pronouns. There's probably better ways of doing it, but I just want to make sure that it was covered. Um, other things, when we would ask people if they would like to apply, if there wasn't a workshop that they could get to, or they didn't, or they, either there wasn't one happening or they couldn't get to it, what we would do is mentor them on the spot. And so we'd suggest things that we know that they could talk about. We would explain that we didn't want how-to sessions so much as stories, and we would ask if they have a good story to tell about something that they've learned. I also learned this week um, in one of the conversations I was part of, not just suggesting things that they, we know they could talk about, but telling them, you, you are going to apply with this topic. Maybe not quite that forcefully, but um, kind of, instead of just making a suggestion, making it like, this is what's happening. And also, to, um, Duo Talks, uh, which is a great format in general, especially for somebody who's newer, as well as Lightning Talks, the shorter talks. But the thing I learned about Duo Talks was pairing up somebody who might be uh, newer to public speaking with somebody who is already an experienced and comfortable public speaker. So, how did we do after this effort? After all that, we still didn't have many women applicants. And so the night before, in a desperate, last-minute attempt to do something about this. I put up a tweet. It is my not-so-secret goal to get more women speakers at WordCamp YVR Dev. Know anyone great? That tweet got the most retweets I have ever had. 
eight. <laughs> but something, <laughs> it worked. We got a handful more um, people apply to speak. I'm going to go over what our results were after I cover a little bit of, um, I've learned a lot. There's a lot of things I would have, more things I would have loved to have done that year, as well as things that I would love to do in general. And I've built up a wish list of, if I could wave a magic wand and have my ideal situation where I have all the time and money in the world to make everything happen, I would um, make sure that we have mentorship for our speakers, offering help offering to help them with their talks, the slides, etc. And I'm so happy to see that more and more um, events are doing that. DrupalCon offered all of this. Um, when I spoke in Seattle this last year, they offered this. Offering childcare, which I pushed for really hard in one year, and it was too complicated uh, for a lot of reasons. We couldn't actually do it. But magic one scenario, it happens. Um, meeting at different times that work for women with families, so not holding events always at 9 o'clock at night. We had our workshop Saturday afternoons. Um, Seattle started a group for women in WordPress that they hold every or every other Saturday afternoon that's really well attended. Um, and there's also other groups that are doing women of WordPress as well, which may or may not be at those kinds of time slots. But kind of a side note on that, I want to mention, if you do start running a, a women of Drupal group or any kind of um, specific underrepresented group, make sure it doesn't become a silo where they just kind of meet together and don't participate in the bigger group. Um, what these groups have done is make sure to encourage people to use that as a launching point to participate in the bigger group. And also what I'd love to do is reach out to specific communities out there and, and um, form relationships with people of those communities and send out invites. So for example, we haven't started working on getting more people of color out, and so I would try to find out where the, the um, oh, diversity is so hard to speak about. Um, I would try to find out where black coders were in our community and if, if there was such a community that existed and reach out to them, or even if there wasn't specific coders, just, um, you know, finding out the community in general, because I'm sure there might be coders who are hidden in there, or people who might not be coders yet and who want to learn, all kinds of things we could do. Also, giving people a chance to opt out of photos. Um, people in general, and particularly often the women blob, might have reasons that they don't want their photo online, particularly often for safety reasons. And also taking care of, is washrooms the right term in the US? I'm Canadian. I think that's right, the toilet's place. I think it's bathrooms that gets confusing to you guys, people, friends. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, making sure that single, single, stall, um, single stalls are available for the people who don't want to identify with the gender blob um, toilet places. Um, and also making sure that the general ones are trans friendly. And making sure that they're big enough to be power wheelchair accessible as well. Offering closed captioning would be amazing. And having sign language interpreters, which is a thing that I'm seeing more and more, even at the local level word camps. And also something that we talked about earlier this week, um, having a volunteer to make sure that new faces feel seen and heard. Because um, one of the people was, was talking about how she was the only woman who came out to this event, and nobody even noticed that she was there, and didn't, she didn't feel supported or seen, and she just left and never came back. And lastly, something that I know we've talked about a lot this week and something that WordPress is focus, putting a lot of focus on right now, which is having a code of conduct. So WordCamp Vancouver 2014, our developer edition, how do we do? We got 60 applications in total. We had 18 spots because we were not going to run three tracks again. 20 women applied. That was almost three times more women applicants in one year from seven to 20. Pretty proud of that. And I'd like to remind you, it was the developer edition as well. So um, I pushed for us to select fully 50%, nine. So if there are two talks that were similar, I'm like, let's take the lady. And then for, for a brief shining moment in time, we had exactly 50%. Nine out of 18. And then, last minute, 
one woman and one man dropped out. And of course, um, our other co-organizers were men. They were net networked better with the developers in our city or who were coming from the nearby cities. And so the backup speakers that they had were men. Um, and so then we had eight out of 17, almost 50%. I'm counting it as 50%. <laughs> I want this one. So if you take a look at this, we went from 14% to 47% in only one year. This cat is happy about that. <laughs> and um, I want to talk a little bit about what has happened since then. So other cities, before we made our workshop public, just saw our meetup description about the workshop and were inspired to create their own versions. And so Seattle, Portland, Montreal, and then Montreal also ran it in New York. Um, so they created similar work. And then workshop WordCamp Central asked us to create a workshop script for not just women, but all diversity, so you can um, run it for any particular group, and asked us to gather all the best content from the cities who had created their own. So we created a big version with the best of everything, of everyone. And this is the agenda that we created in the end. Um, so we talk about things like, why do we want more of this particular group to be speaking at our events? The myths of being a speaker, which I mentioned. The, my favorite one, finding a topic. And we also go through some exercises to further refine that topic. And then some things that we added on. Um, in our first year, we did this and tips on being a better speaker. And we found people walked out, uh, they didn't necessarily have great pitches. And so they weren't being selected. So we added in how to write a great pitch. And everybody's favorite, writing their bio. And also, um, they left it feeling a little bit like, so now I have a great title, but where do I go from there? And so we helped them with, we added in creating an outline. And then we also have tips on being a better speaker. And also, um, one of the contributions from one of the other groups was creating great slides. And another thing that we do kind of throughout is leveling up their confidence with public speaking. So we start off um, having people introduce either themselves or their neighbor. And after each section, um, we go around the circle and anybody who would like to do a little bit of public speaking, saying their talk or their pitch, can do that. We also let anybody say pass at any time. And anybody who wants to, at the end, um, can stand up. We reset the room into audience format um, and have them stand in front of everybody so they get that experience of wall of faces. So no matter how comfortable people have become with their new chummy friends for the afternoon, um, they get that experience of what it's like to be standing in front of everybody. And it's, it's great to feel that initial whoa um, with a comfortable group um, before they start speaking at events. So I'd like to report on how that has gone. So in 2017, in uh, the Vancouver WordCamp, we typically have 50% women speakers. Montreal, for several years in a row, got 50%. Pretty sure Portland had 50% as well. I'm looking at the person who was... No, okay. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I checked with them, and I'm pretty sure that's, that's true. Um, Brighton confirms that they did. And also, this year, for the first time, we had a record-breaking in Seattle, 60% women speakers. This cat is extra happy about that. And so I want to um, talk about where we're at now in 2018. Now we have a new challenge. And our new challenge is uh, at uh, WordCamp Central came back to me and said, OK, we know this is proven. This workshop works. But nobody knows about it. This is the next thing that we want to work on. And so somehow, by the end of that conversation, I found myself creating and leading a team um, called the Diversity Outreach Speaker Training Team in WordPress, and we created a goal. Uh, we felt it was a, an achievable but slightly stretched goal to try to get 27 meetups uh, to run this workshop material, and that's 5% of, at the time, when we said it, it was 5% of our meetups worldwide. We've had quite an increase since then, but uh, I'm not officially raising that number at this point until there's a reason to. And also, um, we're kind of 
promoting it about women, but we're also encouraging people to run it for other groups as well. So we're making sure that there's also resources for uh, people of color, queer folk, people with different physical abilities, different mental health, older folk. There's, there's underrepresented groups that I've never even heard of. I never even thought about older folk until I gave this talk a few months ago and two people came up to me and said, hey, what about us? And so I'm learning about new groups all the time. So I'd like to report on how our team is doing with that. So far in 2018, the, the groups that have run it have been Vancouver, Canada, a few cities in Brazil, a few cities in Italy, and internally at a few private companies. And uh, we have a form where we have people sign up who would like to run it. Groups who have expressed, countries who have expressed interest in running it more places in Canada and the US, Greece, Spain, Germany, Japan, Nigeria, South Africa, India, UK, Malaysia, Bangladesh, Netherlands, Lebanon, Liberia, Philippines, Venezuela. So far, that's in the first two months since we've launched this form, I feel like this shows that you know, the world is hungry for this work. And I also like to mention that that's just listing the countries, it's not even listing individual cities. We have 30 signed up as either having run it or wanting to run it this year. So we might even exceed our goal, and we might even do that early in the year. That's amazing. We've had some amazing changes. Back to Vancouver for a moment. We've had some amazing changes in our community in particular. First of all, the workshop that we had brought out not just women, but um, brought out diversity in other ways. There were people of color, people with different physical abilities, people with different pronouns, I cannot speak to if there were queer folk, but I'd like to think maybe there were, but that's of course not something that we would find out in any uh, visible way. Also, several of the people who went through and started speaking at our meetups and our word camps became, stepped up and became leaders in our community. And they created things that we didn't have before that benefited everyone, such as um, a couple of the ladies created a user track in our meetup. And it also benefits local businesses. I have one story in particular where um, there was an agency who attended our WordCamp, loved one of the women speakers, and hunted her down to hire her, and she became the first woman, woman web developer that they had at their agency, and now she's actually leading the team. And the thing that's really exciting to me that I really want to underline is creating more diverse organizers and leaders. This is the thing that is really exciting to me about this work. There's all kinds of reasons to have um, diverse public speakers, but the one that really gets me going is um, seeing more organizers and leaders of, seeing more diverse organizers and leaders um, shaping and leading our technology and depending on how far I can go with this work, maybe even shaping the rest of the world as well. I would, I would personally, I would love to see a world that was led by more diverse people. And so, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm almost done the talking portion, but I would like to talk about Drupal for a moment. Basically, I would, love to see this kind of work happen in Drupal, and this is something that I've spoken about a bunch of times in conversations this week, so some of you are hearing this again. I would love to see um, this workshop and some of the other um, action items for getting more diverse speakers happen, and this is something that we have the materials to support you doing it if you don't want to be reinventing the wheel. As a starting place, you might change a bunch of things, but um, our workshop is available up online at diversespeakers.info, and it's something that I created in the first place as being really easy to swap any kind of technology for it. So all you need to do is replace a few words, change plugins to modules, a few little things like that, and you're good to go. Even within WordPress, sometimes um, the language isn't quite, quite right. Like in Italy, they ran it for WordPress marketers, and she said, oh, these questions are too technical, and I'm like, you can change it. <laughs> Write your own questions. And we also, in addition to the workshop, the other thing that we did is we created a place where people could read about it, learn about it, and sign up to get more information from us, and if they want, also get training um, from us. So 
um, whoever I wind up speaking to about doing this work, this is something that I can offer as a starting place suggestion as well, depending on how Drupal works, but that's that's something that I'm sure we can figure out. Um, if you want to see ours, it's at tiny.cc slash wpwomenspeak. And so I just wanted to, oh yeah, so I am looking for someone to champion this work in Drupal. And I also wanted to mention that this isn't just about getting more speakers of different types. It's about what happens when you give different voices a voice. And I'd like to challenge you to think, what would be the positive changes in Drupal if you led the charge and you, and you helped people around the world do this workshop? End of my talking session, part, part, section. Oh, do I only have, no, I still have an hour, I have 20 minutes, okay, great. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so before I take questions, comments, discussion, I did wanna um, kind of address what kinds of things you could ask about. So anything I've talked about, women, diversity, men, not all men, which is a hot topic, what you could possibly talk about if you wanted to start public speaking, our workshop, our community, answering your questions about public speaking, me, anything else related, etc. So we have a microphone at the front. Afternoon and thank you for coming, Jill. Frankly, notice I'm a white guy. <laughs> And thank you for being here. You're welcome. As the white guy and business leader, how specifically can I better promote talking about diversity, given that in, in some of my meetings, frankly, I've got 13 white guys. You know, they're all business owners. How do I start, uh, in a way, raising the stick? We gotta be more diverse, more diverse. All right, so the question is, um, when you and your entire team are all white guys, and this might not be a topic, the thing that they've ever thought of, how to approach um, the, how to even appro uh, start approaching bringing it up and having them see that this would be right. a good thing. The, in this particular case, uh, these, these are, you know, there's 13 of us uh, that are different, uh, different agency owners or uh, mm -hmm. leaders within the agencies. And, um, you know, frankly, there are times in which I'm not able to get women or other uh, diverse groups of people to be able to come in because they feel uncomfortable being around all the white guys. Wow, okay. Um, so um, diverse folk aren't comfortable coming in because it's a group of white guys. Excuse me for a second. First of all, thank you for asking that question. That is a fantastic question. And that's not a question that I've ever been asked or thought of before. So I'm going to think, and while I think, if other people have answers, please come up to the mic. I'm sure I'll think of something. Um, I know for our workshop itself, one of the things we encourage, we have quite a few white men allies who would like to help us with it. And one of the things that we say is, it's great that you wanna help with it, and if possible, please don't be the one leading it. Please ask a diverse person to lead it. So is that some, can you get, if you're gonna say something, can you get back to the mic? Uh, so I just recently kind of shifted to, in a way to that model. Uh, frankly, I'm just going after it. It's like I find people that of, you know, basically non-white males that I consider that would be a good champion to work with. Mm. And frankly, I just go for supporting uh, them making introductions to other people and allowing them to be uh, speaking on the diverse on diversity topics and things like that to try okay. to encourage. Great. So you're doing the you're doing the reaching out and you are um, getting more diverse folk to start speaking. Well, uh, it's sort of say like within the uh, business community. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, it feels weird. I'm specifically targeting targeting female, you know, female business owners. Okay. It's like, hey, I really would like to try to make this be a more comfortable environment for you. However, right, yeah. as the white guy, I cannot champion this because 
you right. know, it looks like the white guy <laughs> is going like, Hey, I want to do more business. And I just want to, you know, yeah. I, I, I okay. want others. I want to be able to support champions to actually to encourage uh, yeah. others to come in. I have a couple thoughts and then um, it looks like Mark and some other people are lining up in the queue. So I can speak to, um, you know, for meetups, if the meetup is all white guys, how to comfortably bring people in and speaking about that might give some ideas. One is extending invitations to people to come and then when, we're, when they're there, making sure that they feel seen and heard, um, making sure that there's... I, like, um, I would love to have, say, a volunteer or a, a couple volunteers be the people who make sure that the new folk who come in, especially diverse folk, um, get greeted, welcomed, ask how they're doing. I've participated in some groups where I've been the only woman, and they've come up to me afterwards and said, you know, how, how are you finding it being the only woman? Are you comfortable? If any, anything ever comes up, please tell me. Um, as well as... There's a thing that tends to happen in a group of guys that um, the, the woman or, or uh, other non-cis um, born male um, might not, uh, they might express some idea and might not get heard. Often what happens is they'll say an idea and then a while, and nobody pays attention and a while later somebody else says the idea and everybody goes, that's a great idea. And so one of the things they can do is um, hear people, give them credit for their ideas, things like that. Line up of people who either have answers for this or other questions. If, if they have um, answers for this, let's start with that. Mark? Sure. I, I don't have definitive answers. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, one of the things I think about is, you know, I've, I have this unearned privilege, right? So how can you at least try to, you know, not give that privilege, but, but like make use of that in a way that's positive and helps others. And so, I mean, I think all the things that Jill just said there are fantastic. I think, I, I think you know, uh, lifting up others' voices is great. I think you can speak out I mean, first, I think it's important like to do the work of learning, you know, for 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 white guys to to do the work of like learning and trying to understand everything before speaking. I think is important. But then when you you, you know, I think be judicious, but like you talk about racism, talk about sexism, and say it's bad and and you know like like and and like if in your room with other guys I mean maybe this never happens but I mean there's comments get said sometimes that are inappropriate right so raising your voice if that happens yeah. it can be really uncomfortable but like if you do it there might be somebody else there's like I wanted to say something but I didn't know if I could or not. And if you raise your voice, other people will too. So, um, but I yeah, like the great. model of being supportive um, and not trying to be the one in charge. And, but, but being there and doing the work, I think is important. So, yeah. Say what doing the work means. Um... I find finding ways to get involved in a way where you're lending your resources and your time uh, in ways that are positive and help, you know, not just thinking about like mentorship is great, but like sponsorship is like, is this term that gets used that's even better where you're like, not just saying, hey, I'm going to be your mentor now and help you out. But like, you know, trying to like, hey, I'm going to help suggest, you know, you as a speaker as for for hiring for working to help people get promoted like um and especially like i'm if you're in a group of a bunch of business owners you have a huge opportunity to make a huge impact mm -hmm. and like if you can speak up and talk to business owners like it's honestly about ch you know putting you know changing who's in power but also like getting the people who are at the top and are in power like on board with all of this stuff. So you have a huge opportunity to help do that. So 
awesome that you're here and are thinking about ways to do more stuff. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, um, I, yeah, I don't know how to uh, answer your question exactly, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, um, I my, my wife is black and we work together and she, we started the company together. And um, uh, sometimes I'll just wear a t-shirt with her face on it to events and that, I find that really helps. I'm actually joking, that's not, I would not recommend doing that. No. Um, um, I was unsure how to react to yeah, that. Thank you uh, for telling me how to react yeah. to that. Um, it was a terrible joke. Um, but uh, but I, I do think, um, I don't know that I would lead with talking about sexism or racism at any uh, uh, you know event or thing that you're trying to do with people, but um, I would you know maybe start small and just try uh, you know following or uh, you know listening to people on social media, um, you know kind of I, I empathizing or, or seeing things from somebody else's perspective isn't something that we do. Um, is like humans by default, like it's hard, you know, it's hard work to think, you know, from somebody else's point of view. So, um, you know, um, I, I would, I would probably start there. I found that that's pretty helpful to just see what, you know, other people, um, think of, uh, you know, that are in a, in a minority group, um, are struggling with and having to deal with and, and just, you know, being, um, being uh, available and there for them when those situations arise, um, you know, maybe not trying to just like tackle it as like, a, you know, let's solve this and let's, you know, let's just start bringing people into, you know, to, to our group, but, um, you know, just be a little bit more patient, I think. I don't Great, so, so paying attention to their different perspectives and bringing them in probably a lot more than that as well. Yes. Um, thank you for this discussion. Um, um, I've just I've been living in this country for about five years now. Um, I I have a particular question, and one, and the question is is when you have these kind of discussions and you invite, say, the ladies to submit some some topics and they are selected. Do they sometimes get a sense? that they have been selected simply because they are women and not based on their content? Because I get that a lot. Sometimes um, I would prefer that I'm selected based on the quality of my content than rather than how I appear. And mm. when I'm filling in, say, job, job application forms or uh, forms with, from the government and where you have to specify your race, whether you're black or white or whatever, I sometimes feel that by selecting that, maybe uh, they are trying to meet some quota and just select right. me for, for, but not necessarily based on on what I know or based on my resume or based on the content of my work. Do you right. sometimes get tend to get that from some of the people you tend to work with? Yeah, this is a great question. So the question is, um, in your experience, you sometimes feel like you're filling a quota rather than... Right actually being hired for um, your skills and experiences. And you're wondering, um, do we have the same issue when we have women um, speakers? I have heard a lot of different opinions about this. Um, women have come to me saying, I hate being selected because I'm a woman. And I've had women saying, I love being selected because I'm a woman. And my argument for that is it's not just about filling a quota, but it's also about hearing diverse voices and getting more unique ideas. And so um, for me, it's more than just ticking off a box of we have women speakers. It's actually having more um, unique perspectives, voices, um, and the, all the things about chipping technology, all the things I mentioned earlier. So basically, we get mixed, result, uh, mixed reviews, and this is my answer to them. Um, one of the things you mentioned, you know, for bringing new people into a group is someone showing up, not necessarily feeling welcomed and included, and then potentially never coming back. And mm -hmm. especially if that's their experience in the past, 
they're probably going to be really apprehensive about a new group as well or coming in again. And I think, you know, that's a big burden to ask on them. Like, hey, we would really like to include you because you're different than our current group. Mm. But, you know, that really presents them very directly with that fear of I'm going to be the odd one out. Um, and I think one mm. way maybe to address that, you know, is to leverage that to say, well, I'm not going to ask someone to just come into this group, but say, I know a couple people, if they don't know each other, can I connect them? Can I get them? you know, to come together, you know, as a group to this larger event so that they're not out, odd one out and at mm -hmm. least that they can feel I have someone to talk to, even if it's not as inclusive as the larger group. Right. So um, what you're bringing up is a great suggestion of um, not just asking individuals to come back, but actually asking multiple people, two or three, um, and so they don't feel uh, alone and um, not wanting to come back again. Did I get that right? Yeah, and preparing people so that they know there's going to be someone there for them. And preparing people so they know, preparing people so that they know in advance that there's going to be somebody else um, of their diverse group there as well, so they won't be feeling complete, especially if, if they've had this experience before and don't want to come back again, knowing that it's not going to be the same as last time. Thanks for that. Uh, so I wanted to specifically address you. Warren I'm also a, a business person. Um, whenever someone asks me, would you like to join this group? I would like to hear your perspective. As a business person, I always have to ask myself, what's the ROI on that? Am I, what am I going to get out of this meeting? Because a lot of times people ask diverse people to come in to improve their group, but what am I getting out of it? So maybe also turning that into what can, how can we help you? What does your business need? that might be useful. Um, the other thing as well is that some local businesses um, improve diversity by allowing those diverse groups to have space. So a lot of meetups need a space. They need especially accessible spaces that we talked about. And so if the, your business can, or business owners can host some of those diverse groups, they get used to your company, and you're, you're more recognized as maybe trusted. So thoughts. Lovely. So that was looking at what's in it for them and not just what's in it for your group. So what's the ROI for them? And also another great suggestion that I'm blanking out on because I am tired. <laughs> meet up, meet up. Di diverse meetup space. So with accessibility and, and all the other things that we talked about, physical accessibility as well as those things. Uh, we have two minutes. So depending on how, one, maybe two, more, depending on how long it is. <laughs> um, I'll try to be quick. I was just thinking about your comment, and I wanted to mention, too, that when you're seeing um, an under, a person from an underrepresented group, and, for example, a cis white male, mm -hmm. um, because the person from the underrepresented group may have been passed over before, um, that sort of compounds upon itself, and they are less likely to have their resume actually reflect their abilities. So when you, you know, so bringing in people from underrepresented groups might give them the thing they can put on their resume to sort of pad it a little bit and help them be seen in the future. So I think um, it's important to remember that your resume doesn't say the whole story. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. It's kind of a self-perpetuating circle, but it would be great to have some place that helps people break out of that cycle so they can put uh, more experience on their resumes. Yeah, totally. Thank you. It was a great yeah, talk. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so we are calling it a day. You can reach me on Twitter. And also for the next hour, I'll be having a lunch. You are welcome to join me to have more discussion, ask me things. Um, I'm particularly interested in the people who haven't spoken and who would like to start speaking, uh, as well as, as I mentioned, getting a champion in Drupal to start doing this work. Um, so that is where I'll be for the next bit, and thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for spending the hour and, and finding this topic uh, worth your hour and finding it important.
this is the best song. <laughs>